Yes, right. great. Okay, comment, sure. So thank you for staying so long, and I will do my best to really entertain you. So this is, you will see some videos and so on. So this is kind of very practical application. We are from the applied part of the AIP. So basically we try to like, you know, we do the real stuff and we take quite many machine learning models and try to apply them. So this is the concept and this kind of extension, I presented also this similar work previously at the workshop. So basically we move from the fluctuation analysis now into kind of like network neuroscience and topological data analysis. So we're interested to kind of AI for social good, and we would like to develop the neurobiomarkers, which would predict and help people to live longer. So basically those are neurobiomarkers of dementia. And this is really huge issue in Japan. Japan is the super aging society, where it's really many people actually are sliding into dementia. And as I will show you later, we have to remember that dementia very often, it's not a problem just a person of suffering of dementia, but this is the whole society around. So those are the caretakers, those are the family members and so on. There are many cases showing that actually quite often the family members sometimes die faster than actually the person suffering from dementia because the burden is so heavy. So basically if we can do it, and we know there is no drug, so there is no pharmacological intervention for a moment. But the quite many behavioral interventions and having neurobiomarkers would help us to measure and see like, you know, which one would be the best for somebody. So basically the whole concept is coming from the brain computer interface. So this is something we did before. And it's quite nice because this year, Nature Electronics kind of like they voted this technology of the year 2023, which is brain computer interface. And there are quite many big players like you know, Elon Musk and so on, but also we would like to contribute to this one. So basically we developed a new approach. We are kind of end-to-end -end laboratory. We design experiment, we run experiments, we analyze the data, we apply machine learning models and everything is in the single laboratory. So basically we are very open for the collaborations. If everybody, if somebody would like to contribute, we have programming skills. I would be very happy to apply other machine learning models. As you will see for a moment, we have very simple, like, you know, shallow learning results. They're very good because they are very easy to interpret. They are very easy to explain to medical doctors because for us, interpretability would be very kind of huge issue later on. So basically let me explain our approach. So this is our team. Dr. Otake is our team leader and basically mostly Japanese colleagues. I think that's Ola and Yui, so we are two foreigners. So basically we have those kind of quite nice vibrant team. Since we are running many experiments, we have quite strong technical support because you have to manage subjects, elderly people coming to laboratory, do experiments with them, etc. So previously from the brain computer interface, which could be divided into three groups, reactive, active, and passive. Reactive is maybe the most famous when we stimulate the brain and you classify attentional response. So this is very solid or at the like, you know, research field. And basically those are well, my former student projects when we did some typing, running robots and so on. And this is really done. And it's sometimes maybe quite a little bit tiring, but it's really like, you know, I would say already very much established. Second one would be the active BCI when we, when you monitor active, like, you know, intentional activity of the subjects. So like in this video here, you will see this musician, or the brain musician in the middle was replaying this very, like, you know, slow music. So this was ex like project with Professor Furukawa from the Tokyo University of Fine Arts. And basically over many months, we trained this, our brain musician who learned to control brain patterns. It's really tiring. You have to do it with the neurofeedback, but basically he was able to intentionally create five stable brain patterns and then he could play like, you know. So it's really, really still tiring and it's really, like you know requiring the long training so what we move now we move now to the passive bci when basically we conduct experiment but we are not interested in the control we are interested in the, uh, estimating the brain state and in our case there would be like healthy aging versus dementia and we would like to kind of find as is as simple as as quick as possible when we talk about the onset of dementia this would be like late 40s 50s so basically dementia is developing over 20 years if we can pick up this as early as possible, intervention would be really working. Like, you know, if you are already at the end, there is, everything is hopeless. So we have these nice EEG devices. And in this paper, uh, in this presentation, I mostly will focus on this here, higher here. Oops, sorry, there is no. So this EEG cup, sorry. Let me go back. So the EEG cup in the center, it has eight electrodes. It's wearable, so it has a Bluetooth. It's so-called dry electrode, so we don't need to put any gel, it's super practical. 
Now we plan experiment that we would be sending those EEG cuffs to our subject at home and they would be recording EEG themselves. So this is kind of side effect of pandemic. We stopped experiments for almost three years. So there was no new data. Now we can like, you know, restart everything because ethical committee allowed to do the experiments and also we'll send them home. There are also simple wearables like this one, which we put as a band, but quality of the EEG is a little lower. So this could be the issue. So basically, we kind of position our research in one of these kind of United Nations of Sustainable Development Goals, good health and well-being for everybody, and AI for social good. So basically, the numbers are really bad. We know that the dementias are really rising. We are aging, so people are living longer, but for a moment, the brain is not following, like, you know, this kind of, like, you know, healthcare, which, like, you know, we can maintain our body very well, but not so much the brain. We know that there are no pharmacological, pharmacological intervention, but luckily World Health Organization already like, you know, is monitoring this and they kind of publish quite nice many reports showing that dementia could be reduced, stop, or even maybe reverse. And those are all so-called non-pharmacological interventions. So you can change your lifestyle, you can change the way you eat, you can change your social, social life and so on. So basically not everything fit everybody. So having neurobiomarkers like this guy kind of elderly lady, who would do this kind of experiment maybe once a week at home and maybe kind of monitor like, you know, she would kind of improve social life and we will really see if the brain is getting younger, is being like you know, more flexible or not. Maybe would be going for some sports, like, you know, so basically something missing in their life. These days, there, there's a big success for the healthcare in the heart diseases when elderly people are measuring blood pressure every day and they are reinforced like, you know, medical doctors giving them medicine and they're using them because they can monitor how, like, you know, blood pressure. So basically this is the same concept, having this kind of brain neurobiomarker, which could be used at home. So when we think about the brain, Alzheimer's brain is really physically damaged brain. So this is like a physical damage of, 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 of the structure of the brain. So when we think about the neural networks, we might have the healthy neural networks and the one which is heavily pruned and it's really randomly done in the brain. Already, luckily, we know that quite many recent publications, like the one from the Lancet Commission, showing that over the, our lifespan, this kind of beautiful, colorful picture, we can do different interventions. Like, you know, in the early stages, they would be like, you know, taking care of our education, then later, like, you know, taking care of our, our brain, no traumatic brain injury, taking care of the hearing and so on. So actually having healthy life. And later on, like, you know, cutting off on smoking, limiting depression, social isolation, and so on. So there are quite many already known factors which can improve our well-being and delay dementia or even stop it. We know that actually most of the cases of dementia, so-called Alzheimer's diseases, Alzheimer's syndrome. So basically due to uh, like toxic uh, proteins in the brain, the brain is being physically damaged. Second one will be so-called vascular dementia, which is related to our blood system. So basically delivery of the oxygen and so on. So if we can cover both of them, Alzheimer type and the vascular type, it will be almost 90%. So having biomarker covering those two would be quite interesting. For a moment, we mostly focus on Alzheimer's. This would be EEG. So measuring electrical activity of the brain networks. Second step would be for the vascular, it would be using so-called FNIRS, which is monitoring the blood oxygenation of the brain. So having this device, which would be monitoring too. And most of the dementias, most of the cases are actually mixed. So we have to also take it into account. So, so far, there is really a headache because most of the established tests are so-called paper and pencil tests. So this is one of these kind of mocha tests, which you really, you cannot do it every day. You have to have like, you know, trained psychologists, and I will show later some results showing that like, you know, if we didn't have very good psychologists, those labels could be very much mixed. So basically our dream and our goal is really to get rid of those paper and pencil tests, but for a moment we refer to them because they are kind of gold standard, and we have to take this into account. So there are quite many candidates in the neuroscience for the, like, you know, for the uh, biomarkers of aging and dementia, but as we tried over some recent years, they are not so good and uh, you know, classification would be like maximum 80%. So we try to develop something new and as Lord has been saying, if you can measure it, you can improve it like, you know, so that's the goal for this, our neurobiomarker. So this is work we already submitted now for the frontiers in human neuroscience. So using this machine learning approaches using for dementia neurobiomarker using network uh, neuroscience approach. So this is my yesterday poster, but just show me, let me show you as a kind of reference. So some of you attended the poster. So this was our first approach when we use the topological data analysis, when we analyze the EEG from the four like, you know, channels as a kind of point of clouds, like cloud of points in this case. 
And we use classical like PDA features, like the you non-person know, homology, number of cycles of this kind of nice structure. And like in this case, also like entropy. And we could really see when we did the clustering, so this is supervised human clustering, that we could really nicely separate those two groups. So basically our subjects go through the test. MOCA test is like from zero to 30, but we know that 25 is the onset of so-called mild cognitive impairment. So if you are 26 and over, you are really healthy aging person. If you are 25 and below, basically some trouble starts over the you know. So it's really showing, but what was really interesting, and this was data we know from the kind of, so this was our preliminary study and the psychologist who, developed, who was measuring this MOCA was kind of like, you know, maybe not very well trained. And we can really see that there was some subcluster very close to our healthy subject class. You know. So it's really showing that those labels are not so strong. And that's why classification results were like, you know, below 90%. So let's come back to this talk. So in this uh, presentation, we conducted two experiments. Those are kind of famous experiments many therapies do with the elderly people. First one is so-called reminiscent imagery uh, approach. So basically elderly people have preferences to watch people like in you know, the pictures, listening to music from the time when they were younger. So in this experiment, we prepared four subset of images of the interior. So there would be like traditional Japanese interiors from the Showa era. So this is the era when our subject were children. There would be like old Western style pictures. There would be modern Japanese picture and modern Western pictures. And as I tell you immediately, our subject really prefer those ones. They're always very critical, but this is the task. And second experiment is kind of training experiment when our subjects are learning to evaluate Western abortion. So basically those are mostly Japanese subjects. When we do it with Polish subjects, we change those videos. So in the first state, they see the video. So you will see next one, the experiment in the short video also. And we show them kind of five seconds long emotional phase. Later on, we show them where this emotion is being classified by psychologists using valence and the arousal kind of two-dimensional, uh, in this case, pattern. So this is kind of like classical psychological evaluation. We believe our subject don't do classified emotions like that. And then we ask them later to put this point exactly on the touchpad. So this is so-called implicit learning, like, you know, the learning is kind of automatic procedure, like, you know. And actually both experiments so-called a uh, so-called dual task experiment. So even we give them cognitive task, but we don't care about this result. We, what we care about mostly is kind of the level of the awareness, like, you know, how long they can stay aware and on, the, on this topic, on the, on the task. So this will be the video. Let's, this is one of this kind of professional actor uh, with emotional expression. We show like, you know, where this emotion is placed on this dimensional grid, and then the subject having touch pad is putting. So it's kind of copy paste. It's very simple, like in this case. Experiment in the second part, there is not this kind of prompt. So basically they see the video and they have to kind of remember like, you know, where this emotion was classified. So this work was very much uh, like, you know, inspired by the recent publication of the Royal Society of Open Science about the topological an the, the analysis of the brain dynamics. And this was the paper which was analyzing the brain waves from the uh, monkey. So basically the same monkey was awake was given two types of the anesthetic. So basically one was the ketamine and the second one was propofolol. And what we really nicely observe, I will explain later how we build those network, but for the awake monkeys, the, those number of nodes and number of edges, this network modeling the EG was more complex. When we use it for those two uh, anesthetics, basically the numbers were dropping. So basically being awake is related to the more complex EG or the brain. What is also interesting, this uh, approach, because we do everything channel by channel. So we can also apply it for the multimodal data. So for a moment, we only use EEG. So we have this eight channel EEG system. But as a next step, we already started experiment. We can also add eye tracking. And this could be analyzed together. Like, you know, we also know that actually eye movement patterns, pupil size and so on, are also biomarkers related evil with age. So what is very nice, we take the EEG, we take the vector, kind of embedding vector, we decided about vector 20, the length, which is around 80 milliseconds of the, of the EEG. This is a kind of stationary EEG. And basically we convert them from the real EEG values into this kind of like, a, this kind of permutation vectors. So basically the whole thing is done as follows. We take the EEG X, then we actually take our embedding and we, and we create the vector, which was having this kind of delay in this case, time lag, which is the first zero crossing of the autocorrelation function. We sort them and then we replace them, our vectors in those kind of indexes 
of the, from, from, from the sorting. So basically from the EEG values, we go for the nice kind of like limited numbers of, of, our, of our permutation vectors. But basically we can create a network which basically is created by the time as, as the time is evolving. And if there are connections, basically those connections are being created. So it's quite nice the way of creating so-called ordinal partial network which is modeling the EEG. For us, it's very good because it's kind of compressing the signal. And as we know, EEG recording from different subjects have different values. So basically you can escape from this kind of scaling issues and having this beautiful network model. So when we look at the results, they are really interesting because as you remember from the original paper from this monkey study, they could see that actually monkeys awake having the larger number of nodes of those modeling networks and had also larger number of uh, connect uh, uh, of the edges. And this is exactly what we see also with our subjects. Our healthy subjects have those kind of more awake brain waves. And again, when we do, in this case, unsupervised human embedding, in this case, we can really see, we can quite nicely separate them. There will be some overlap, but in this case, MCI would be blue and the healthy subject will be on the left side. So it's quite nicely separating for a moment. The next step would be having fully kind of like a regression model but we can use the full economic continuous MOCA scores, but for the moment, we don't have enough subjects. And this is results from the first experiment when the subjects were learning this emotional evaluation. Second experiment, beautifully reproducing those results when our subjects were evaluating the emotions. And again, we have quite nice, exactly confirming. Those are statistically significant differences. So our MCI versus healthy subject, again, confirming this awake versus in this case, anesthetized, like, you know, of kind of men, maybe mind wandering the subject, which is also common. It's known that people who are aging total dementia, they give a lot of this kind of ruminative, like, you know, mind wandering. That, that's why they're kind of mentally absent. As they slide to Alzheimer's, quite often those people are very disconnected from the reality. So this is kind of also nice uh, confirming. And again, we can quite well separate them together. So basically this would be like an you know, input for the next classifier. So basically we build the features which takes those values from the electrodes and we have nodes and, and the edges. It's also showing the electrode PZ. It's kind of confirming experimental setting. PZ is the electrode which is in the back of the head. And since mostly we have female subjects because those are subjects who are more contributing time to our experiments, quite often females have more hair here, like, you know. So this result also is showing in the future we, can, we will completely discard this PZ electrode so we can use less like, you know. So it's also kind of nice, in this case, data-driven, uh, like, you know, support for our experimental setup. And similarly, but a little bit more noisy was from this, our uh, picture evaluations. In this case, because we use at the beginning shorter time, so videos are five seconds, this is only two seconds. We can really see that those distributions are kind of more overlapping and also lesson learned. We need a little longer EEG to have more stable, those, more stable those network. But again, this kind of separation is quite nice. There will be some overlapping, but you know, they are a little bit noisy. So the best slide for me at the end would be our very nice, very encouraging classification results. And as you can really see, those are no differences between the different classifiers. So we are kind of for a moment in the shallow learning approach, but we also train like you know, like deep neural network, fully connected neural networks, having only seven layers. So it's not really very funky. At the top, we would be results around below like 95% you know, for this emotion evaluation learning, quite nicely, a little higher for the emo emotion evaluation, in this case, uh, uh, checking. And there will be also for our picture. So it's quite nice, you know, when you talk about the 95%, this is kind of like almost production already, like, you know. So we kind of really hope that we can talk to maybe some you know, pharma companies they are very much interested in having this kind of neurobiomarker because this is the way they can also evaluate the medicines like you know. The level of awareness, the awareness, the level of awakeness is very much related to the depression, quite many mental in this case diseases. So it could be quite interesting. And as I told you, the concept that we can do this experiment at home, it could be quite like, you know, also good during pandemics and so on, but also people who can really evaluate their like, you know, uh, in, 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 in interventions. And this is also nicely related to, to, to the DCI. But just to conclude, we are hitting 95%. So it's quite nice, but encouraging. We have to remember the limitation. Our group is still like, you know, 33 subjects. So this is really limited. We don't have the full, like, you know, coverage of our MOCA scores in this area. So this is also very much limited. 
we also have to remember that those kind of AI based dementia, uh, like you know, neurobiomarkers, will have to have some ethical, like you know, overseeing because you know, some people can like you know, misuse it, like you know, for judging like you know, mental states and so on. So, 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 so this will be quite interesting. In the future, we, as I said, we want to expand it to adding the eye tracking. Eye trackers are quite like you know, low cost these days. And also having FNIRS, FNIRS is a little more expensive because this is optical imaging of the brain using infrared. But we really hope like, you know, that those devices would become kind of more affordable. So basically sending EEG and FNIRS to home would be also interesting as the subject would really monitor like, you know, their vascular and the electrical brain function. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so maybe a very general question. So, I mean, my understanding is that you would like to do early detection of dementia, right? So, and so can you comment on, I mean, here you, you treat the problem as a classification problem, yes. but I guess that among the subjects there might be like, you know, easier subjects, harder subjects in the sense that they ha might have different stages of yes, uh, yes, sure, sure. dementia. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, how, how do you take that into account somehow? Yeah, so for a moment, because our group is still small, we did for the, we went for the classification, but the regression would be the final, like, you know, because even if you go for the intervention, there would be not this kind of binary switch, like, you know, MCI, LP, I guess they will be kind of moving. So basically having, as we have those, our nice plots on those embeddings, maybe we can plot for the subject, how they travel between those two spaces, like in this case. I mean, right now you have a clear gap between the two. Yeah, because for a moment it's binary. So this is like a, for the binary to have two classes. I the UMAP to... is not using the label, is that correct? Sorry? The UMAP, that you, the, the UMAP uh, dimension yeah, sure. reduction is not using the information about the label. Yeah, so we are coloring later after the label. Mm -hmm. Ah, so I guess the gap is because we have still small number of the subjects. Like, you know, so this is yeah. limitation of the current study. Like, you know. I really hope this will be continuous like, you know, in the future. Once we have more subjects and we have kind of full coverage, like, you know, I can show you like, you know, this is our current coverage. So you will really see we have some subjects that have very good MOCA scores. We have some, and there will be some in, 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 in the center. In the future, I really hope we can collect more subjects and discover it will be more uniform. And then probably this human will be like, you know, more rich, I would say. And we will be coloring it later with the MOCA scores. It will be more colorful, like, you know, and this continuous traveling will be maybe realized. Thank you. That's good. So can you go back to the experimental results? Uh, sure. For all, all five methods, basically the performance. Okay. Yes. So this means the difficult samples are always difficult. And yes. Ones are easy. Sure, sure. So then can you somehow observe what, what were the difficult samples? Are they just like label noise or? I think was, there was like an, on the EEG side, there was noise. And also, because no, this is leave one out for validation. Mm. So basically each subject was contributing like 24 samples. Mm. Maybe we have to remove those kind of noisy samples in the future. Mm -hmm. We do the experiment for 24 images, like, you know, but if we see that there is, for a moment, I just wanted to use all data, like, you know. Mm -hmm. But maybe we have to kind of do some, like, you know, pruning of this noisy. Mm -hmm. But g given that those, those, you know, error samples are noisy, and mm -hmm. once you get rid of them, then basically you can achieve 100% accuracy. I hope so, I hope so. So, yeah. And also you said, so female subjects are mostly in the experiment. Yes, yes, so this and is also kind of like- Did you, know, you observe any like difference between genders? For a moment, no, we didn't look at this, like, you know, yeah, maybe I can look at like, you know. mm. like, you know, technically because males have less hair, so they generate better EEG, like, you know. Mm. But like, <laughs> you know, whenever I have experiment, I have an elderly gentleman coming, it's like, oh, good, like, you know, because there's not so much hair, like, you know. So there is this kind of technical part, like, you know, even myself, I have less hair, like, you know, but, because for a moment we have only like uh, only I think like five males and the rest are females, like you know. So this kind of gender for a moment discussion. Well, we have a lot of male subjects. Sure, sure, you're welcome. I can contribute. <laughs> yeah, as I told you, like you know, it's really nice to start it as early as possible because then you can really see like you know that your dynamics are maybe already uh -huh. worrying some. Other questions? Yeah. Thank you for the great talk. Uh, so what are the background of healthy participants, like ages or uh, backgrounds of, uh, not, not backgrounds, but uh, ages of healthy participants? Ah, okay. So there, so, like, no, so there will be the ages mm -hmm. in this case. So we have like, you know, 60 plus, like, you know, those are people who are kind of usually enrolled in some kind of like elderly clubs and so on. So that's why, you know, we never tried for a moment the sporties. 
or this would be the next step, like, you know, we want mm -hmm. to do it with the, like, you know, and, and as you can see, we don't have all the MOCA scores. People have different education background and so on. So this is like, you know, mm -hmm. but all of them are kind of like, you know, healthy functioning, like, you know, so even they have like quite often very low MOCA scores, like 12, which is kind of like, you know, shocking a little bit. Those are people who are coming by themselves to ex for the experiments mm -hmm. and in like, you know, and they are going home by themselves, like, you know, so it's well-functioning elderly, like, you know, with different levels of okay. permission. If you come to weekends, you tell me to turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> actually, once I was asking... Lots of, lots of <laughs> actually, one, once I was asking our ladies in the office, and they said, "No, no way! Like you know, you know never do it." <laughs> so yeah. I like this one. So I'll just conclude the, the Thank you so much. Thanks.